Hello everyone, I am Manish Mamtani from India. I am a professor of structural geology at the Department of Geology and Geophysics, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur in India. I also occupy the position of Vice Chair of the IUGS Commission on Tectonics and Structural Geology, uh, that is Tech Task for uh, a term starting 2016 going up to 2020. I have uh, always wondered as a student of uh, structural geology that what actually goes into identifying the correct reference frame for kinematic studies in structural geology. Many times we come across rocks in the field that uh, contain foliations and lineations and uh, textbooks of structural geology uh, always advocate the use of uh, the XZ reference frame of the uh, strain ellipsoid as the correct ref reference frame for kinematic studies. But how easy or how difficult is it to actually identify uh, this XZ reference frame in the field and if you can't identify it in the field in several cases as we shall see during the course of this PPT uh, then uh, what are the solutions uh, so that uh, information about the reference frame can be extracted using certain laboratory techniques so this is the motivation for uh, making a monthly seminar uh, out of uh, this particular question about identifying the correct reference frame for kinematic studies in structural geology. As uh, we are aware that uh, identifying the correct reference frame uh, is very critical in uh, kinematic analysis and uh, in structural geology because many structural geological investigations they require uh, the determination of the sense of shear and uh, this uh, kinematics uh, plays a very important role uh, in uh, understanding large scale tectonics as well as uh, micro scale processes uh, many structural geological investigations uh, today involve a uh, lot of quantification and uh, quantification of vorticity has become a very important thing in uh, many studies uh, where the scientists uh, they want to evaluate the type of flow uh, that uh, is responsible for deformation whether it is pure shear or simple shear or a general type of flow. So all this improves actually the understanding of deformation and structural evolution at uh, various scales. But the important point is all kinematic analysis requires a reference frame. Uh, so uh, let us look uh, back in time how it all uh, started at least this is uh, to the best of my knowledge that the reference frame and its importance uh, became uh, became prominent with the work of uh, the Austrian uh, scientist uh, Bruno Sander who wrote uh, a fantastic book in 1930 and which uh, later on was also published in English in uh, 1970 entitled An Introduction to the Study of Fabrics in Geological Bodies. And uh, it was the work of uh, Sander uh, that actually brought to light the fact that uh, the direction of main slip or uh, the direction of tectonic transport, this would be defined as the A direction and uh, he wrote in his book that the AC plane of deformation in the kinematic sense and uh, this is the most uh, prominent uh, persistent symmetry plane. So this AC plane 
uh, was considered to be extremely important for kinematic studies uh, by Bruno Sander. And uh, by the time uh, um, we were into the uh, 1960s and early 1970s, uh, it was uh, well established that the axial plane foliation uh, is defining the XY plane of the strain ellipsoid. And as uh, uh, students of geology, we all know that the strain ellipsoid uh, has three principal axes, X, Y, and Z, where X is greater than Y is greater than Z. So if uh, we look at the uh, works of Ramsey in the late 1960s, uh, Sidans and Wood in the early 1970s, and then uh, by the time we come into 1976 and then 1980s, the work of Professor Ghosh uh, from India, uh, it was uh, well established that uh, the foliation plane that we see in any deformed rock like say a schistosity in a schist or an isosity in a nice, a slaty cleavage in a slate, uh, this defines the XY plane of the uh, uh, and uh, when we go further uh, ahead in time, uh, we come to the mid-1980s uh, and then uh, into the 1990s, uh, it was uh, very common to come across terminology like the XZ section of the strain, uh, strain ellipsoid. Uh, and this uh, uh, plane, the XZ section, was defined as the section which is parallel to the mineral elongation lineation, which we call the stretching lineation, and parallel to the and perpendicular to the foliation. So the section which is cut perpendicular to the foliation and parallel to the mineral elongation lineation uh, in a rock is the XZ section of the strain ellipsoid. And as we know it today in the 21st century, uh, when we come across uh, or when we read the books like uh, Pashkir and Trau or Twiss and Moors or Hakon Fossen or any textbook of structural geology, uh, we know that uh, if you have a foliation plane in a rock and on the foliation plane, if you have a stretching lineation and uh, this block has the three principal axes x, y, and z of the strain ellipsoid, then the foliation plane defines the x, y plane of the strain ellipsoid and the uh, stretching lineation which lies on the foliation plane gives the x direction of the strain ellipsoid. So this is the section which is parallel to the stretching lineation and perpendicular to the uh, foliation and this is the XZ section of the strain ellipsoid and this actually defines the reference frame for kinematic studies uh, in uh, structural geology. So this can be equated with the AC plane that was defined by Bruno Sanders and this is why I brought in a bit of history initially in this uh, lecture. And this plane which is uh, the XZ section or the XZ plane of the strain ellipsoid. This is the section which is uh, the most uh, important one for kinematic studies and it contains all the important shear sense indicators that we uh, uh, commonly study uh, as students and uh, we see these fantastic diagrams in textbooks which can you know, the sections which contain all the uh, rotated porphyroclasts and uh, SC fabrics and shear bands and so on. So if we look at some of the field structures like these, uh, uh, this is a shear, the, this, this figure is, uh, this uh, photograph is of uh, a sheath fold in Coptic Reyes. This is also a shear zone in Coptic Reyes. In fact, all these photos are from one of the field trips that I did during the Penrose Conference in Coptic Reyes in 2011. And 
all these uh, sections that we see uh, right now on the screen these are useful or these can be used uh, to interpret the sense of shear and perform kinematic studies uh, if and only if we are sure that this is the exit section of the strain ellipsoid and uh, microstructural investigations uh, of uh, uh, thin sections which are made in this particular reference frame that is the exit section of the strain ellipsoid are very useful and this is an example from some of the published works uh, in various journals where the crystallographic preferred orientation of quartz has been investigated in the exit section and uh, it is the uh, quartz uh, CPO that is the crystallographic preferred orientation in this reference frame uh, that can actually be used to also comment on the temperature of deformation based on the slip systems that can be interpreted from such uh, uh, pole figures. This is another example from a work by uh, Professor Richard Law and his group uh, on the Moen thrust zone uh, where the scientists were trying to understand the evolution of quartz uh, CPO in uh, the Moen thrust zone. And again, as you can see, what is important here is that there is always a need to have a proper reference frame uh, for uh, making any uh, scientifically uh, valid uh, interpretations and the reference frame always is the exit section. Here you can see the X being defined by the lineation and the plane XY plane is defined by the trace uh, on this particular diagram, this grain shape foliation which is marked on this diagram and uh, this clearly indicates that the reference frame is parallel to the stretching lineation and perpendicular to the foliation. <clears throat> and then if you have uh, other reference frame, other reference frame uh, frames like the XY or the YZ or the XZ section, then we have different uh, patterns of the crystallographic preferred orientation. Uh, in these planes, different planes, and uh, this uh, uh, can be further, you know, uh, digested or understood by going through various textbooks, etc., which is not really the focus right now. The focus is uh, really that uh, the what is the importance of this exit reference frame uh, in kinematic studies, and then uh, highlight on issues uh, related to identification of the reference frame in areas or in situations where we uh, cannot actually identify the exit section just on the basis of field studies. So this is another example to drive a point about the importance of the exit section which I think I've already done but just uh, to be more complete from my side so if I have an exit section, a thin section prepared parallel to the exit section of the strain ellipsoid of any deformed rock, then in that case, uh, it is these types of areas that can be uh, chosen to comment on the uh, sense of shear and work out the kinematics. Uh, we have a block diagram again here in, uh, uh, in this image and uh, uh, we know that x is greater than y is, and is greater than z uh, for a strain ellipsoid. That is the foliation plane, that is the stretching lineation which gives the x direction. This is the exit section. So if I have a rock which contains a stretching lineation as I show here, and this stretching lineation is now shown by these yellow lines. This is the exit section, which is uh, parallel to the foliation, uh, pa parallel to the lineation, and perpendicular to the foliation. 
I make a thin section of this uh, uh, you know rock which is prepared parallel to this particular uh, XZ plane and then I can study the uh, quad C axis using a technique like uh, SEMEBSD and then comment on the slip systems and work out the kinematics. So this is the XZ reference frame. So the, in a nutshell, determination of kinematics as well as active slip systems requires a reference frame. That is the main. But this also raises some very important questions. The first one is, do all deformed rocks develop stretching lineations? How to identify stretching lineations in the field? How to distinguish stretching lineations from other types of lineations? Because as we know from textbooks, uh, you have lineations which can be stretching lineations, which give us the direction of tectonic transport. But at the same time, we can have lineations which are uh, intersection lineations which uh, for example like a cleavage bedding intersection which gives us the direction of the fold axis which in the older terminology of uh, sander was referred to as the a uh, as the b lineation whereas the a lineation is the one which gives us the direction of tectonic transport so the best way to answer these questions is to actually take a look at real rocks in and so here is an example of uh, a nice uh, in uh, the dharwar craton uh, in a part of the dharwar craton in southern india and uh, this is the plan view of the same rock of the same exposure and this is a block diagram and we also have a plan view here and these <coughs> dashed lines they actually define the foliation So, this is a zoomed image of uh, the foliation plane, which is the XY plane of uh, the strain ellipsoid. <coughs> and uh, that is the stretching lineation on the rock, uh, which is giving us the X direction. So, this particular plane in this particular exposure, the plan view is actually the exit section because this is parallel to the stretching lineation and perpendicular to the foliation. So this is our important uh, uh, plane on which the sense of shear can be invested. Another example, uh, this is uh, a graphite bearing a quartzite uh, which was uh, sent to my lab for some analysis by Professor Yano Sodai and uh, this is the foliation plane which is the XY plane that is the stretching lineation that is the X direction of the strain ellipsoid that is the XZ section so this is the reference frame for kinematic studies but in comparison to these examples that I just now showed if we look at this particular uh, micaceous quartzite, uh, which is again from India, and this is uh, in parts of the Eastern Ghats uh, region in eastern part of India. And we have a folded surface here, and uh, that is the axial plane. This is the direction of the fold axis. And this is the intersection lineation, which is formed by the intersection of the axial plane and the folded surface. So again, I make a cartoon here, folded surface, axial plane, that is the fold axis. And these dashed lines actually define the intersection lineation, which is formed by the intersection of the axial plane and this particular folded surface. So an important point to be noted now is that this intersection lineation is not parallel to the X direction of the strain ellipsoid. So based on this video, uh, we can uh, take away some very important points. 
the first one is that it is common to come across rocks that develop intersection lineations but it is relatively rare to find rocks that have uh, stretching lineations uh, a rock may be considerably strained or deformed uh, and still it may not develop a stretching lineation uh, because uh, just because of the fact that its uh, mineralogy does not allow the development of uh, such a stretching lineation uh, for example uh, if we uh, look at say very pure quartzites uh, which have very little mica uh, then uh, uh, such rocks you see they do not develop uh, a stretching lineation in fact uh, uh, while doing field work in uh, uh, terrains that contain banded iron formations uh, you know banded hematite quartzites banded hematite jaspers we see that the rocks have uh, been intensely uh, deformed uh, they are intensely folded uh, they are refolded they show superposed folds uh, uh, but they don't develop even axial plane foliation because the lithology just does not favor the development of such uh, field foliation and lineation uh, a, a rock uh, may not have undergone sufficient strain to develop uh, stretching lineation this is another aspect so you know it is these uh, reasons uh, or there may be other reasons that uh, are responsible for the lack of uh, development of uh, stretching lineations in rocks let us take a look at some of the natural uh, examples <clears throat> now this uh, particular um, photograph is from uh, a part of uh, the dharwar craton uh, in southern india and here you we see uh, there are sheared uh, you see extensional veins actually uh, in a shear zone that is cutting through the uh, metabasalts which is the host rock and uh, uh, this is a highly fractured uh, host rock and uh, uh, there is uh, some foliation but uh, it cannot be very accurately recorded uh, in most places in the field uh, and definitely the rock does not contain a stretching lineation although it may have a recordable foliation. Uh, so if uh, I take a, an oriented sample from uh, this particular shear zone, uh, from this particular vein, and uh, I want to study the sense of shear uh, uh, by performing, say, a quartz uh, CPO study uh, under the scanning electron microscope using EBSD, then the first question would be uh, where is the exit section of the strain ellipsoid so that a decent interpretation can be made from uh, uh, the data that will be generated because data can always be generated in any reference frame. So the problem with the, this type of natural situation is uh, where is the exit section for performing kinematic Another example from the peninsular gneiss, again from the Dharwar Craton in southern India, and we see the foliation trace on uh, the exposure, uh, but the sample does not contain or the rock does not contain any stretching lineation. So we have a foliation which is the XY plane, but then on this XY plane, where is the x direction it could be anywhere anywhere on this plane and in the absence of stretching lineation it is uh, not possible to comment on the x direction uh, just on the basis of uh, field observation and there are many questions that uh, need to be answered in rocks which do not have uh, visible foliations or stretching lineations. 
uh, one of the such rock uh, one of uh, such rocks is uh, a granite or several other plutonic rocks uh, which uh, require a lot of regional deformation uh, to be emplaced uh, and there are large number of studies that deal with establishing the time relationship between fabric development and regional deformation but if uh, one wants to uh, carry out uh, <clears throat> uh, certain kinematic studies or identify strain gradients in uh, plutonic rocks like granite then uh, one needs uh, information about the uh, principal axis of the strain ellipsoid and any um, kinematic study would require the exact section but where is the exact section in such rocks uh, uh, this is always challenging in structural geology studies <coughs> Similarly, here I show some uh, field exposures of uh, uh, metavolcanic rocks, metabasalts, which contain uh, veins uh, from uh, the Gadag region in southern India. And uh, this is a province uh, where uh, gold has been reported uh, uh, in, in, in the past. And uh, if one wants to uh, carry out uh, structural studies uh, dealing with the structural control on uh, vein emplacement and mineralization uh, either in this area or any such similar area in the world then uh, information about the uh, uh, orientation of the three principal axes of the strain ellipsoid uh, is critical also the such veins uh, you see they tend to uh, dilate the pre-existing uh, anisotropy and fractures and many times in such areas uh, where there are metabasalts and metavolcanic rocks uh, foliations uh, are not uh, visible in the field and yet there is a systematics in the orientation of veins and uh, therefore it becomes uh, very important to understand how uh, the de regional deformation uh, influenced some fabric development in the rock which may not be visible but it is still there and then how this uh, fabric which is not visible to the naked eye was exploited uh, by the veins and subsequently uh, some of these veins got mineralized. So uh, these types of studies uh, dealing with the structural control on mineralization uh, require an in-depth understanding about the uh, uh, orientation of veins and the relation with the uh, XYZ uh, reference frame of the strain ellipsoid. This is an example of uh, a very pure quartz rock, a quartzite, uh, which under the microscope shows a lot of dynamic recrystallization and deformation textures, but in hand specimen or in the field, it does not show any uh, foliation or lineation. So if one wants to uh, uh, carry out any kinematic analysis in such a rock then it is uh, essential to identify the exact section as we have already discussed in many previous slides but then where is the exact section in the absence of a foliation and stretching lineation so this uh, leads us to an important uh, uh, conclusion that there are several limitations of uh, uh, field studies when it comes to uh, kinematic analysis. The takeaway points are all strained or deformed rocks do not contain visible foliation and or stretching lineation. Many rocks are foliated but lack a stretching lineation despite having undergone general shear 
that is a combination of pure and simple shear and I would also uh, extrapolate this a bit further that uh, it is quite likely that many rocks undergo simple shear but still because of the rheology of the rock they just do not develop stretching lineations. So in such cases uh, where is the XZ section? What should be the kinematic reference frame to so that you know uh, uh, the sense of shear or other kinematic studies can be taken up in the so the solution to this particular problem of uh, identifying the XZ section or the correct reference frame for kinematic studies lies in anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility so um, AMS or anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility is a very commonly used uh, petrofabric tool uh, and the basic physical you know principle is uh, pretty simple that uh, if you have any material and uh, uh, we place the material in an external magnetic field then uh, uh, magnetization gets induced into the material and the uh, strength of this magnetization is directly proportional to the strength of the external magnetic field. The constant of proportionality is referred to as the uh, magnetic susceptibility. So uh, this particular property is exploited uh, uh, quite, you see, um, is exploited uh, effectively for petrofabric studies and to determine the uh, reference frame for kinematic studies. So let me explain with the help of uh, a few schematic diagrams. So this is an image uh, which uh, represents, let us consider a rock. Uh, with uh, uh, several uh, randomly oriented minerals uh, which are represented by these red triangles. Now when we place this in an external magnetic field then uh, the induction takes place, induction of magnetization takes place along the long axis of these different minerals. Uh, and uh, uh, in a particular position or orientation of this particular sample, uh, uh, we can measure the bulk susceptibility. Now, if we change the position of this sample in the external magnetic field, so I show this particular image of the instrument and I don't go into the details of the instrumentation because that would be another uh, presentation. But these are three uh, different orientations of a sample in an external magnetic field. So I can, if, if we imagine that this uh, uh, particular schematic diagram uh, represents, you know, the first position here, and then we are able to measure the magnetic susceptibility of this rock with these different randomly oriented minerals in this first position, we get a value say X, uh, SI units. And uh, now we change the orientation of this particular rock and we place it in a different position in the external magnetic field and then we measure the bulk susceptibility. Now, uh, because of the fact that this particular sample uh, has uh, minerals which are randomly oriented, so irrespective of the position of the sample in the external magnetic field, uh, the uh, magnetic susceptibility or the bulk susceptibility of the sample will have the same value x because for each uh, position, the uh, induction will take place along the long axis of the different minerals which are in any case randomly oriented. So uh, we can say that uh, or we can consider that a 
sample that has uh, randomly oriented minerals has an iso has isotropic magnetic susceptibility or the sample is magnetically isotropic because it has the same uh, magnetic susceptibility in every position of the sample. Now if I was to deform this particular sample, uh, this would lead to the development of a preferred uh, fabric because the different minerals they would rotate, uh, they would recrystallize in a certain orientation thus developing a preferred uh, fabric. And now if I place this sample in an external magnetic field then the induction naturally will take place along the long axis of the different minerals. Now because uh, these minerals now are no longer randomly oriented, they are preferentially oriented. Therefore, the uh, bulk susceptibility of the sample will be more in one orientation as compared to another orientation in the external magnetic field. And this gives rise to the anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility and such samples, they are magnetically anisotropic. So this AMS analysis actually uh, leads to uh, providing us with a uh, lot of useful information. And the basic thing is that we get information about the orientation and magnitude of the three principal axes of the AMS ellipsoid, which has three axis k1 k2 k3 k1 greater than k2 greater than k3 as can be seen in this particular uh, uh, diagram so what is the methodology that we follow we go to the field we collect oriented samples we prepare them for our analysis and as i said earlier i don't go into the details of the technique because that would be another presentation we drill samples, we drill cores uh, from the sample, normally five uh, cores uh, for every oriented sample. And then we analyze this with the help of an instrument, uh, the fabric analysis laboratory that I have in uh, uh, IIT Kharagpur in my institute uh, is the KLY4 S Kappa bridge, uh, which is manufactured by Ejiko uh, which is a company in Czech Republic and uh, once we analyze the AMS then we get you know data of the three principal axes of the AMS ellipsoid which can now be plotted uh, uh, on lower hemisphere equal area projections and then the mean orientation of uh, K1, K2 and K3 for each individual block sample can be analyzed. Uh, the plane uh, that contains the K1 and K2 axes uh, defines the magnetic foliation plane. The magnetic lineation is defined by K1 and K3 is the pole to the magnetic foliation. So let us look at some of the data that we get from AMS as I said the magnitudes and orientations of the principal axis of the AMS ellipsoid where K1 is the magnetic lineation, K3 is the pole to the magnetic foliation. Uh, we also can then compute uh, or calculate the degree of magnetic anisotropy uh, which uh, is a measure of the eccentricity of the AMS ellipsoid. Uh, we can also uh, determine the shape of the ellipsoid, whether it is oblate or... And then this information of the AMS ellipsoid and the orientations of the principal axis of the AMS ellipsoid can be equated with the three principal axis of the strain ellipsoid. Uh, and now I show you an example uh, to justify this particular equivalence of the principal axis of the AMS ellipsoid uh, with the principal axis of the strain ellipsoid in an LS tectonite 
uh, from uh, 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 Greece you see so let us uh, look back uh, once again at the block diagram and digest it and re rather revise it once more that we have a foliation uh, bearing rock where the xy plane is defined by the foliation and the x direction by the stretching lineation and the section parallel to the stretching lineation and perpendicular to the foliation is the xz section now this sample from greece this contains a foliation the foliation has a stretching lineation and based on the visible fabric that is the foliation and the stretching lineation we know uh, the we can identify the exact section of the strain ellipsoid now ams analysis was done in a core which was extracted from this particular sample and then the field data and the AMS data were both plotted on the uh, a lower hemisphere equal area projection and we find that there is a fantastic similarity in the orientation of magnetic data and field data. So here we see that the star represents the pole to the field foliation and this orientation is similar to the pole to the magnetic uh, foliation which is defined by this which is represented by the circle and the stretching lineation uh, that was uh, measured in the field uh, has an orientation which is similar to the orientation of the magnetic lineation so uh, what this particular uh, study and comparison of the field data and the AMS data reveals is that uh, in a rock which is an LS tectonite uh, we are able to demonstrate the similarity between the orientation of the exact plane of the strain ellipsoid and the K1 K3 plane of the AMS ellipsoid and then in this particular uh, XZ section we are of course able to uh, do a lot of uh, microstructural studies uh, measurement of quad CPO and so on so the X Y and Z axis of the strain ellipsoid can be equated to the K1 K2 and K3 axis of the AMS ellipsoid respectively now we can extrapolate this particular uh, concept to a rock which does not show uh, visible foliations and lineations. So here is an example of uh, a quartzite uh, which is deformed uh, but it does not show a clear foliation and definitely does not have any stretching lineation. So we perform AMS analysis on uh, such a sample and then we uh, want to identify the exact section of the strain ellipsoid and then we are interested in uh, preparing a thin section parallel to this uh, exact section but we use now AMS to identify the K1 K3 reference frame and then prepare a thin section parallel to the K1 K3 section K1 K3 plane so in this equal area projection I can plot the two planes uh, P1 and P2 and then uh, the AMS analysis uh, has already given us the mean orientations of the three principal axes of the AMS ellipsoid K1, K2 and K3. Based on this I am now able to identify the K1, K3 plane which will be the uh, you know common uh, great circle uh, girdle that is passing through K1 and K3 in this particular lower hemisphere equal area projection and uh, once I have done this I can actually identify the pitch or the rake of uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, K1 K3 the intersection line of the K1 K3 plane on the uh, plane 1 as well as the plane 2 and I am able to mark these on the block uh, on which the AMS analysis was done and the cylindrical cores were extracted and then I can then identify the uh, K1 K3 plane and parallel to this K1 K3 plane uh, I can make a thin section for microstructural studies or for kinematic studies for uh, de determining the sense of shear to identify presence or absence of shear sense indicators and so on. So I can uh, do a similar exercise for the uh, different planes, the K1, K2 plane as well as the K2, K3 plane and the K1, K3 plane. I just now showed you how uh, this can be done. So from any particular block, uh, rock block, uh, uh, which was collected uh, in the field, uh, we can do AMS analysis and we can identify the K1, K2, K1, K3 and the K2, K3 planes and then we can make thin sections uh, parallel to these three planes and our interest right now is the, the, the uh, reference frame which is of kinematic importance for uh, kinematic studies and Therefore, the K1, K3 uh, plane, which is equivalent to the XZ section of the strain ellipsoid, is the critical reference frame right now. So now I will present a case where this particular methodology or modus operandi was applied to a rock from, of uh, peninsular gneiss from the Dharwar Craton in southern India. I actually showed uh, the sample earlier and I'll come back to it in the next slide. But uh, this is the sample location very briefly because the regional geology and the stratigraphy uh, and uh, other regional aspects are not really important right now for this particular presentation. Uh, so the audience has to uh, take my word for it that this particular sample is located to just to the south of uh, a shear zone which is the contact between the peninsular gneisses and uh, a granite uh, in the southern part of India in the Dharwar Craton and uh, based on some other studies that uh, I and my team had done we knew that there was a lot of strain partitioning happening uh, around this particular granite uh, at the lithological boundaries. So how the sample looks like in the field, uh, it's an S-tectonite and as I said earlier, I already showed this uh, uh, photograph earlier uh, while defining uh, the problem of identifying the reference frame in rocks, a reference frame for kinematic studies in rocks that are devoid of uh, stretching lineations. So this is the same photograph of the peninsular gneiss which has the foliation trace and it does not have a stretching lineation. So we do not know where is the x uh, direction of the strain ellipsoid in this sample. So what we did was we carried out AMS analysis of uh, this particular sample. We extracted uh, uh, several cylindrical cores uh, from the sample and then we did AMS and then we uh, uh, got the mean orientation and magnitudes of the three principal axes of the AMS ellipsoid K1, K2 and K3. So that is the magnetic lineation which is given by the blue box that is the mean orientation of the magnetic lineation. Uh, this star shows the orientation of the field foliation pole. Uh, because as uh, I said that the rock has a foliation, it is an S-tectonite, uh, but it does not have a stretching lineation. And that is the uh, pole 
to the magnetic foliation though. So this is the mean orientation of K3, which is the minimum uh, principal axis of the AMS ellipsoid. And following the methodology that I showed in the previous uh, uh, slide, uh, uh, we can determine the K1, K3 plane in the block sample which is remaining after AMS analysis and uh, this K1, K3 plane gives us the, it represents the exit section of the strain ellipsoid because K1, K2 and K3 are equated with X, Y and Z of the strain ellipsoid. And then a th so now once we have uh, a thin section which is prepared parallel to this uh, K1, K3 plane, uh, then we can uh, study the microstructure in that thin section as well as we can uh, perform uh, EBSD studies uh, under the uh, scanning electron microscope in that particular you see K1, K3 reference frame which is equivalent to the XZ uh, reference frame of the strain ellipsoid and uh, in this particular sample the quartz uh, CPO uh, gave us very interesting results and a top towards 325 degree sense of shear was uh, deciphered with the help of uh, EBSD data and this sense of shear fits uh, very well with the regional kinematics uh, which involved uh, strain partitioning uh, around uh, the granite. Uh, the interested reader can always read some of the papers uh, for further details. The references are already given uh, on the left hand side below in the slide. Uh, to drive uh, the importance of AMS uh, data and AMS studies in uh, identifying the correct reference frame for kinematic studies is also brought out by uh, one of uh, the recent studies that was done by uh, my research team. Uh, again, I'll skip uh, the uh, regional geology and stratigraphy. Uh, the interested reader can go through the paper by Kuswami et al. 2018 Journal of Structural Geology. Uh, now here in this particular area in again in Dharwar Kraton in southern India the host rocks are the metabasalts and these contain uh, sheared veins of quartz and calcite. Uh, most of the loca uh, area, most of the exposures in the area, they do not contain uh, very well defined foliations and they definitely do not contain stones. So this was an ideal area for uh, uh, doing uh, AMS studies and then using the AMS data for uh, uh, kinematic analysis. So a large number of samples uh, of the meta basalts were collected from the field and then subjected to AMS analysis and uh, the mean orientation of the magnetic foliation was found to be um, uh, northwest southeast uh, striking with uh, very steep dips and uh, the magnetic lineation was also very steeply plunging. So that is the mean orientation of the K1, K2 plane uh, for all these uh, samples put together. That is the orientation that is northeast southwest striking orientation is for the K1, K3 plane in the Hatti region uh, and uh, that is the orientation of uh, the mean orientation of the magnetic lineation of the study area. So this uh, is the mean orientation of uh, the X direction of the strain ellipsoid and the K1, K2 plane is now defining the mean orientation of the XY plane of the strain ellipsoid and the K1, K3 plane gives us the exact 
of the strain ellipsoid and that is the critical plane for this. So now let us again take a look at this sheared vein and I showed this photograph also earlier in my presentation. So we have uh, the quartz calcite vein which naturally appears to have developed because of shearing and uh, the host stroke metabasalt is fractured shows a foliation which can be in places measured but it does not have a stretching lineation now we do not know whether this is actually the exact section of the strain ellipsoid so if we want to do anything with such an oriented sample in terms of uh, kinematic studies then we need to actually uh, know the reference frame so and that is very important because in this particular uh, slide and in this particular sample we see the presence of extensional quartz veins and there are also laminated quartz veins so the question is how close is this thin section to the exit section of the strain ellipsoid because uh, any sense of shear in uh, in the rock or in this section uh, without having a knowledge of uh, the kinematic reference frame would be absolutely vague. So to address this question now we start to correlate the orientation of this section which was collected uh, from the field uh, with the uh, XZ section or the K1 K3 section of the AMS ellipsoid and as we can see this is the exposed surface and it is not too different from the mean orientation of the K1 K3 plane for the Hutti region. So the orientation of the exposed surface in the mine and this sample is from an underground mine from Hutti. This is sub parallel to the mean orientation of K1 K3 plane for the Hutti region. So this section actually represents the mean orientation of the K1 K3 plane for the Hutti region. Uh, I hope the, the, the viewer is uh, able to understand my Indian accent uh, because I am repeatedly using the word Hutti, Hutti, this is name of a place in Dharwar Kreton, in, uh, in Dharwar region in southern India. So coming back to the thin section, we have uh, now identified that this is sub-parallel to the K1, K3 section of the uh, strain ellipsoid in the entire region. So in this particular K1, K3 equivalent to XZ section of the strain ellipsoid, we are observing uh, the extensional veins and then the EBSD of this uh, gives us the sense of shear in this K1, K3 or the XZ reference frame. Similarly, the laminated quartz vein in the same thin section is uh, also giving us very interesting uh, quartz CPO data in the uh, K1, K3 reference frame. Uh, in this particular case, the extensional vein gives us an indication of prism C slip and an indication of non coaxial flow, whereas uh, the laminated quartz vein gives us a typical type 1 crossed girdle in the K1, K3 reference frame. So, for details about these slip systems, I uh, uh, recommend that uh, the interested uh, uh, listener, viewer can go through the paper by Goswami et al. 2018 Journal of Structural Geology for the purpose of the present uh, objective of application of AMS to identifying the proper reference frame for kinematic studies. I can only now conclude that for this particular uh, vein in the mine, a down dip sense of shear uh, could be identified uh, 
which helps us in understanding and relating the origin of these veins with the regional deformation and the structural control on mineralization in this region because this is a mine where there is uh, you know gold is being uh, mined from this particular region finally i present the example of another uh, metabasalt from the same hatti region in dharwar kraton uh, where this sample block as you can see does not have a very clearly defined foliation and it does not have a stretching lineation so we did given uh, we did ams analysis on this block and then identified the uh, k1 k2 and the k1 k3 sections uh, for this particular block sample and then the k1 k3 section which is the xz section of the strain ellipsoid uh, was identified and a thin section was made uh, uh, parallel to this K1 K3 plane of the AMS ellipsoid. And uh, this particular uh, uh, section showed presence of uh, foliation traces which otherwise were not uh, easy to identify and in parts it also showed uh, quartz veins and also sheared veins and uh, this is one of the enlarged parts of this um, extensional vein uh, in this particular uh, part of the metabasalt so this was then subjected to ebsd studies and kinematic studies in fact even without ebsd analysis uh, just you know the kinematics of uh, this particular vein can be related with the uh, fact uh, from the theoretical knowledge that uh, the fracture the opening uh, develops uh, in a direction which would be perpendicular to the direction of isa max the instantaneous uh, stretching axis maximum uh, and this uh, uh, indicates a dextral sense of shear in this particular reference frame so in the geographical reference frame it actually indicates top towards 205 uh, degrees uh, sense of movement uh, and the same thing can be interpreted on the basis of ebsd studies that were done uh, on uh, quartz grains uh, uh, in this particular section so this indicates stop towards 205 degree sense of shear so based on this example and the previous example where the quartz vein from the underground mine uh, uh, was you know investigated in a reference frame which was the regional reference frame uh, of the ams ellipsoid uh, we are able to conclude that in the Hutti region, there is a dominantly down dip sense of movement uh, on the uh, K1, K3 planes. So this is a very interesting finding that has come out uh, on the basis of uh, an integrated study of AMS and EBST uh, on rocks from the Hutti region. and. Uh, I and my team are quite uh, confident that this is going to go a long way in uh, uh, upgrading our knowledge about structural control on gold mineralization in the so the concluding statement uh, or concluding statements I must say on the basis of this presentation are that AMS data can help identify the kinematic reference frame in rocks that lack visible foliations or stretching lineations the k1 k3 section of the ams ellipsoid in deformed rocks can be equated with xz of the strain ellipsoid and microstructural or ebsd investigations in this section yield uh, scientifically valid results uh, I end uh, with a philosophical statement which was uh, 
made by the great Albert Einstein, uh, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. This statement is, uh, or this philosophy is particularly important here because I believe that uh, uh, I and my team actually ventured into a very unique, uh, you see, approach of trying to identify the reference frame for kinematic studies by integrating AMS with EBS data, which uh, has not been tried uh, before. So we tried something new and uh, we hope to keep our, you see, motivation and curiosity alive to keep doing new things. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, for persons who are interested in contacting me for uh, discussions or collaborations are welcome to write an email to me or they can even look at details uh, about my laboratory facilities and the kind of research that we do on uh, my home page or also on my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.